So on this side, um, I'm really, really excited to have everybody join us today. We have both Caitlin and Miles joining us from Creativity Inc. today. Uh, and we're gonna be talking a little bit about their experience building and really working with a ton of really amazing clients in the voice space. So with that, we're gonna get started. So welcome everybody. Um, Hopefully you guys know by now, but this is a webinar series that is hosted by VoiceFlow. We are a tool that makes it easy for people to design, prototype, and build voice apps with little to no code. Making it easy for people to create proof of concepts, create with better experiences and upload with ease, and ideally being able to democratize conversation, design, and development for just about everyone. And in this series, we do a ton from interviewing thought leaders, highlighting creators and their stories, and connecting with business minds and futurists and ideally doing all, all that while growing with our community. So with that, let's get started. Um, I'm today's host, Emily Lunetto. I'm the head of growth at VoiceFlow. Um, and I'm very excited today to be sitting down with Caitlin, who is the Senior Director of Marketing and Business Development at Creativity Inc. As well as in the audience, we are joined by Miles Elbert, who was the conversation designer that helped build the two skills that they're gonna be highlighting today. Thank you so much for joining us, Caitlin. Can you give us a quick little intro? Hi, I'm Caitlin Goodikens. I'm the Senior Director of Marketing at Creativity, as Emily stated. And I've been with the company for about two and a half years, helping to build up our voice unit. Um, I focus on bringing in new clients, but also um, helping with our relationships for Amazon and Google and VoiceFlow, which is one of our newest partners that I'm really excited to talk about. Um, I'm going to be sharing a presentation just talking about the history of the company, how we got into um, the voice app space, and also um, how APLA has really helped um, us build the most engaging apps that are possible. Awesome. And with that, I am going to pass the reins over to Caitlin. I'm just having trouble sharing my screen. Okay. okay. Give me one second. Are you able to now? That's right. Perfect. Looks good? Yeah, looks great. Okay, fantastic. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm going to be talking about um, APL for audio. Um, this is a new technology that was just in, unveiled during the July 22nd um, Alexa Live event. And uh, we were privileged to be working on it behind the scenes in partnership with VoiceFlow in order to be able to release um, two new apps that feature this technology day and date with that announcement. Um, so a little bit about creativity. Um, we're a design and development studio based in San Carlos, um, outside the Bay Area. Um, we've been around for 21 years, building engaging experiences for kids and their families primarily. Um, so we have a long-term long of experience in building projects that are very audio forward. Um, we also do programming and experience design um, for some of the top brands globally. As an example for some of our partners, we work with almost every toy company globally, as well as um, entertainment studios like Disney and Netflix and Nickelodeon. Um, and then I mentioned that we're also partners with Amazon and Google and uh, preferred agencies who, who work on building branded experiences for them. Um, in the lifetime of the studio, uh, the bulk of the products that we've actually released are in the physical space. So we've worked on robotic toys, um, Tickle Me Elmos, Hatchimals, and Fingerlings. If you have kids um, in the, that have been in the ages of five to eight in the last few years, you're familiar with these. We've also worked on brands um, as iconic as Star Wars and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Disney Princess, as well as helped to launch new brands in the toy space. Um, some of these projects um, feature the, the latest technology that's possible, and what's really unique about the toy space is that price points are pretty sensitive. So we're always looking for ways that we can be technology forward, but also be very mindful of a parent's um, spending habits and um, willingness to try and keep things low cost. Um, so we work with our clients to feature the latest technology and to do so in a cost effective way, and to to meet global expectations um, for, for brands that can go really reach the farthest corners. We 
merged into the voice space in 2017 with Google first. And uh, we helped them build out some of their, their earliest um, library for kids. Um, so we published two apps with them called um, Strangest Day Ever and Jungle Adventure. These apps have actually gone on to garner over 150,000 monthly active users. So they've been quite successful. Um, that led us into working on other really iconic brands, um, as, for example, from Stranger Things to The Wiggles um, to Disney Music, which is a skill on Alexa. Um, we've worked on um, things for Turner Music, things directly for YouTube, um, Coachella. So we've had a privilege to work on a lot of different types of brands. Um, starting out in 2017, it seemed that a lot of people were really in the space so that they could test out what this new technology platform could offer their brand. Um, so they didn't have high expectations. They were mainly looking for um, in and out experiences that could be more campaign drivers for, let's say, a new season or um, a new a new um, extension of their brand. But the expe expectations weren't super high in 2017, 2018. Um, that's really changed over the last few years, and now people um, even have dedicated departments who are looking at um, ways that they can build up a robust voice experience for their customers. Um, this goes in line with how adoption has really raised over time with smart speakers and the fact that now one in four households have a smart speaker um, in their home. Um, of course, also um, allowing for the fact that everybody has a smart assistant in their pocket with uh, Google Assistant and uh, Bixby and, and Siri being on, across most phones. Um, so what we've learned over the past few years is that our core, um, our core client base of toys and family companies, um, that actually can be synonymous with the um, type of experiences that we're building for voice. Um, while previously technology has been a place where families experience some friction with screens and um, tablets being something where parents sometimes don't want their kids to have these personal devices, the fact that smart speakers are shared devices that are in the home has really made it so that families are approving of this technology and rapidly adopting it. So families love voice. And one of the reasons is because it doesn't disrupt the time when they're together. So if you think about um, a board game experience or a time when um, kid, parents and kids are sitting down together, it's meal times. It's when they're doing their homework. It's times when usually they don't want a TV or um, a kid to be playing with their tablet. But with voice, you can ask for help on your homework. You can ask Alexa to tell a joke. You can play a game together and still look at each other without the disruption of that screen. Um, so it's a way for a really highly emotional sense, um, audio is a very um, emotional sense, it's a way for families to continue to engage and to um, experience a, a new experience, a new game experience together. So we've really harnessed that in the way that we approach the, um, the design of our experiences and trying to make them very rich, um, very robust, and ensure that as people are playing with them, the interactivity is first and foremost. Um, so some experiences that we've built um, that have gone on to be really um, top engagement um, opportunities. The first is that I'll highlight is Disney music. Um, this Disney hits challenge, um, which you can open by saying, A, I won't say it, <laughs> I won't trigger everyone's devices, um, by saying, Alexi, um, open the Disney hits challenge. Uh, this was designed for Disney music as a way to help deepen engagement with their um, portfolio of classic songs. And so um, as everybody was moving on to streaming devices, they started to build up some branded playlists. And this is a way for people to engage differently with those playlists. So if you play the game, um, it asks you a, a bunch of trivia questions related to the most iconic Disney songs. And um, there's leaderboards, so you can compete against your friends and uh, track your, your progress over time. And then at the end of it, you can open up a playlist to yeah, refresh your memory of all the different trivia. Another one um, that we built for Google is for The Wiggles. Um, the Wiggles is a top touring musical group from Australia, and um, they go on tour and have millions and millions of fans uh, who love to come and sing their songs with them. Um, but not everybody can make it to the concert. And so we created a screened experience on Google Canvas that allows um, the fans of the Wiggles to be able to experience what it's like to go on a journey with them and ar arrive at the concert. So it's a fully voiced experience with music um, that that 
lets you choose um, who you bring with you on the way to the concert and super engaging and fun. And preschoolers who love to do things over and over again love the fact that it is branching and so there's uh, repeatability in, built into it. Finally, um, we've been on the forefront of the Alexa gadget space. And so um, in February of this year at New York Toy Fair, we announced along with our partner KidCraft um, that they will be producing um, their first kids playset that features Alexa technology. Um, so there will be over a hundred different accessories that are RFID enabled and that interact with um, the playset and trigger a smart speaker and a, an echo device to um, have fun sounds and to guide a play experience through this. Um, so it's really first of its kind. Um, I think this is sort of where the future is going with voice assistance where it's built into the technology that we're using every single day. Um, so getting into APLA. I mentioned that a lot of the experience that we have as a studio is built around audio. That was the first service that we offered um, in 1998 when the studio was founded. Um, it's what drove us to adopt other areas um, with programming and a knowledge of the type of technology that goes into enabling really rich audio experiences on toys. And then the gameplay expertise, which follows um, and is really necessary for designing an intuitive experience for kids that's driven by audio and not by screens. Um, so the fact that we now have the technology with APL audio that enables us to do more with audio and to have a much higher quality has been extremely exciting for us. Um, so the two main areas that I'll talk about, and I'll highlight um, each of these as I go through the next um, examples of the two skills that we just released, are the fact that the audio is just higher quality and the fact that you can now mix and layer audio files in a new way. Um, so quickly on the first one, the sample rates are higher and are now at a, a music streaming quality. You can render more files at once in a single response and adopt different types of files and use them. Um, and then on um, the mix and layer aspect, you can now put audio with Alexa speech. Um, you can change the uh, fading and the trimming for those um, so that it feels more natural when you're hearing one above the other. You have multiple voices with sound effects. Um, so this really enables you to have a rich experience and to have that all happening at runtime. So the two new skills that we built, um, the first of them is called Toy Doctor. Um, this was a skill built for, for preschoolers, and it was inspired by um, everybody being stuck at home during the pandemic. And most notably, kids are experiencing a lot of anxiety. Their regular every day has been taken away from them, even if parents try to hide it. Um, they're feeling the anxiety in the household as people are worried about jobs and the sickness itself. Um, and a lot of ways that kids respond to this is to role play through it. So there has been an influx of kids who are, you know, seeing being a little morbid maybe um, as they're going around and taking each other to the hospital and treating boo-boos. So we wanted to address some of that in a light way and to um, create a skill that features music and sounds and um, makes it really engaging for a kid to talk through some of their anxieties and role play through them. Um, so while it doesn't address the pandemic directly, this was a response that was built to that. Um, so Toy Doctor is about a young, uh, girl, uh, she's a Latina girl named Olivia, um, who lives with her grandmother, who is a doctor at a local hospital. And when her doctor goes to work, she and her dog Bruno open up their own hospital at home, and they uh, treat their, their pets and their, their little plushies and stuff. So um, I have a few examples of what the audio now sounds like with, um, with the, the new APLA that I'll play right now. It features custom sound effects, custom music, and um, four really great voiceover talents that we worked with remotely, actually, which is very interesting um, because of the pandemic. So here's the first one, which is the intro. <laughs> Bruno says hi. My abuelita works at the local hospital. She helps people who are sick or hurt. She's my hero. So, while Abuelita is at work, I help out by taking care of my friends here at home. That's why they call me Dr. Olivia. Olivia? Are you there, mija? Hola, Abuelita. What's up? I'm off to my shift at the hospital. Just wanted to say bye before I go. Okay, I'll see you later. Hasta luego. Call me if you need anything. Hasta luego. Now that Abuelita is off to work, 
It's time for me to do my part. That's right, Bruno. The doctor is in. Um, I also wanted to just talk quickly about um, what it's like to be working with uh, voice actors during the coronavirus. Um, so it, normally we have three studios that are state of the art. They actually do have um, their own dedicated filtration system. So the air is like really well filtered, which is perfect for the coronavirus. But some people aren't um, comfortable coming into the studio and some people just are far away. Um, so we've been able to tap in remotely and to record our audio and to, um, and to uh, mix and edit it for our, um, our different experiences without much disruption. So here's just a quick example of one of our voice talents in the studio. What song do you want to sing? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Do you want to sing, wash your hands, cover your face, 478 breathing, the Boo Boo song, or sometimes my tummy feels funny? What song do you want to sing? lines compared to what we might do for a normal script. Um, the next skill that I'd like to talk about is animal rock. So this one um, was all also conceived internally. Um, a lot of people at Creativity are actually musicians, um, some of them having doctorates in music or having been professional music musicians or still professional musicians. So it's very close to our heart to teach about music and to create engaging experiences for kids to learn about different instruments. Um, so Animal Rock was born from that. It's for slightly older kids. Um, it features a little bit more edgier um, style of, of interaction. Um, but what we did for, with this one was we enabled kids to choose different characters from different bands and then show them what the choices of uh, those different genres would look like if they were to all be assembled into a song. So the fact that APL Audio was announced right after we had started this was kind of a, a really <laughs> amazing thing because all of a sudden those 700 possible song combinations that we would have had to custom mix on the back end were now able to be done at runtime because of the new technology. So I'll play a little bit on this one. This is not a screened experience, so it doesn't have um, visuals yet, but it does have really fun music, which was um, composed by our in-house composer. The Wolfgang! <laughs> and on drums, Cindy Bachman! <laughs> All right, we've got our four parts. Get ready to hear your song. Take it away! All of those songs um, feature four different parts and they can be from four different bands. So again, over 700 permutations that now are made possible just to be mixed right now at one time and also featuring that higher quality audio, which is great for music. Um, so, so that's sort of the, uh, the examples that I have prepared. Um, we're really excited about how this will enable, again, really rich audio moving forward. Um, and, you know, we are excited about the, the presentation language and how we can now sync animations and and video or or graphics to um the audio as well because it just makes for people who do have screens to ha have a much deeper experience with that um that's engaging so um i think at this point i will turn it back over to emily and i'd love to answer any questions that people have um i encourage you all to get into this technology and to um really enjoy it and play with it. Um, we feel, felt like it was really intuitive um, and are really excited that we were able to partner with VoiceFlow to uh, make this technology possible for our skills. Awesome, thank you so much, Caitlin. All right, I am going to pop over on my screen. Okay, great. Um, 
Cool. So thank you so much, Caitlin. We have a bunch of questions that are on, so we're going to get through those best that we can. And again, uh, to everyone in the audience, feel free to use the Q&A function. Uh, we will have some time to go through those as well. So first question here, you have a really amazing background in marketing and business development, not only at a lot of product companies, but now at creativity representing a lot of those experiences. How has your experience differed in, let's say, voice or these more experimental interfaces versus what you used to be doing or even with some more core, uh, some more core immersive experiences? Yeah, that's a great question, and I'm glad you brought it up. Um, I think the biggest challenge with voice right now is that some people still don't understand the platform and how to actually build for it. It's getting better. Um, I mentioned the some of the trends I've noticed with people switching from focusing more on individual campaigns into more of like how they can make their entire higher relationship with the customer has a voice um, impact. But, um, but there is still some education that needs to happen. So at the client level, um, often people will come to me and really rely on me to help them to help prove out why voice is something that they should adopt, um, which is great. I love this. I'm super passionate about it. But it does take some education about what can be done and what features will really help enable them to have a, an impact on their business. On the customer level, when you're launching direct to consumer, there's definitely an education process which needs to happen. Um, so I like to accompany all of our marketing with videos that we put on YouTube that show how other kids or other um, parents are using the, the products that we have released. Um, so for example, with Disney, we built out a trailer um, that shows some, that that gives examples of the type of questions that you can play and shows why it's fun. Um, we also did that for the Wiggles and for Stranger Things so that people can really see what, how other people are using this and just mimic that. So I think that's one of the challenges that comes with any new technology, that you have to show them what the technology platform is doing um, before you even can get to your personal experience. Awesome. Yeah, no, I love the example of taking advantage of video and showing what that experience looks like. Because I think that there really is something magical that comes from actually seeing how people interact with it and hearing it for the first time. And we see that even with a lot of the skills that we see launched in our community as well. Mm -hmm. um, that's great. The next one that's here is how did you first discover conversation design and what resources did you use? And I'll open this up to Miles as well if this is something you'd like to chime in on. I'd love Miles to take this one. He's our, our lead conversation designer and the, the guy who made all the magic um, work with in partnership with the voice flow tool. Awesome. All right. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Miles. Um, by the way, it won't let me start my video. Um, so we first discovered conversation design at Creativity a few years ago when um, Google came to us in their actions for kids initiative uh they wanted us to put an action on google um and we didn't know anything about it really at the time it was super new um it was kind of the wild west out there um so we kind of had to learn it as we went um we right now uh or, or for a long period, we've had a tool set that we've built up that we use to turn things out. And of course, VoiceFlow is a great tool set for doing the exact same thing. But back then, nothing like that existed. So uh, we, we kind of had to make it up as we went um, and just learn what all the restrictions that you wouldn't expect, like just the entire aspect of how um, how the whole mic opening system works. We had been used to toys. We started with a flowchart like we would make for a toy that thought we could do 50 things we couldn't do um, on the Action on Google system. And then uh, we had one of our in-house programmers working on it, um, just building it using uh, he had to learn dialogue flow and uh, then build the back end in, in JavaScript kind of just from the ground up using probably starting from some 
Google example projects. And, and that was written, we really learned all the restrictions and, and how it all works. And what we ended up with was our game, uh, which still exists now on both platforms, Ding Dong Coconut. Um, and the goal was sort of to make a quick, compelling game that's somewhat repeatable. And, and the gameplay is essentially, it gives you a list of, it, it plays a sound effect and then says a word that you're supposed to pair with that sound effect and you memorize it. And then, and it gives you a few of those and then it just keeps playing sound effect, you have to say the word, sound effect, you have to say the word. And then it adds more sound effects until you eventually can't do it. Um, kind of an audio bop it, if you will. Miles, how excited are you that we don't have a five file limit anymore? <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's quite good. So that project was originally on Google, which does not have a five file limit. When we ported it to Alexa, we had to do some weird stuff to get around the five file limit. And I believe we have thousands and thousands of audio files <laughs> stored for that game because the, the pattern is like, when you hear sound effect, say word, uh, or it's just say word. When you hear sound effect, say word, uh, ready, go. <laughs> and then, so like every single, and there's hundreds of sound effects and hundreds of words. So every single one of those like combos has to be built into a single file. Um, so very excited. <laughs> yes, the, it, it will help a lot. If, if we needed to rebuild it now, it would be a lot easier. That's that. awesome. Thank, thanks so much for the insight on that. I'm sure that we'll get a little bit deeper because there's definitely some APL for audio questions that are in here. Thanks for sharing that background. Um, the next one that's in here is, how did your team conceptualize that initial experience for Toy Doctor and Animal Rock? What, what did that look like on your end? Um, I'll field it first and then Miles, if you want to jump in. Um, a, the, a lot of the times when we start a brainstorm, we have a very clear set of um, expectations that we have going into the project. So for this one, um, we actually were quite open. We were interested in maybe opening up to different, to, to adults and, and getting outside of sort of our core and consumer um, with kids. We were interested in ways that we could um, try out new features and, and showcase those. And we were interested in showcasing what we think creativity's real strengths are. And so for us, um, when it comes to audio, as you know, a lot of people get into this space, um, into the voice space, it really is audio where we stand out and we have an edge on people and the ability to create these um, fully voiced experiences with custom sound effects and custom um, music and, and sonic branding. So um, music start, sort of um, led the way after that initial brainstorm. And um, for the first experience, Toy Doctor, um, we were really excited about ways that we could entertain kids differently during the coronavirus. We conce conceived both of these in uh, early April, right when everybody had been sort of sheltering in place for a couple of weeks. Um, so we were sensitive to the fact that that there was this anxiety around the pandemic and nobody knew what was gonna happen. Um, Voiceflow actually enabled us to move really quickly on that because we were able to prioritize our conversation designers um, and not tap into our engineering resources for, which were already dedicated to other projects. Um, so we were able to move really quickly on this and um, the fact that APLA came up right after we had started a partnership with Voiceflow and that Voiceflow was able to um, jump on board with us and to get that um, technology enabled onto their platform, just it, it all worked out. Um, Animal Rock was also coming from the, the minds of our composers and our musicians. And that was something that, again, is really deep to, dear to our hearts and helping kids with fun musical experiences and education. Um, so with APLA and the ability to mix and layer all of those, it all sort of came together so that we could have one that prioritizes the um, kids at home at the pandemic and one that is just really engaging and, and kind of a mix and match fun zine game. Yeah, I feel like you covered it pretty well there. <laughs> cool. Um, so this came from a member in the audience, but how do you market and promote your skills when you first launch? Um, especially since that it's one thing to build, but it's another to make sure that people actually are able to interact with it. 
Yeah, that's a good question. I'd say we're still on this journey for these two skills since um, these are, it's, it's actually rare for us to publish our own skills directly because most of what we do is um, in service for our clients. Um, I mentioned already that best practices include creating a video. Um, we're really big about like looking at, at places where our consumers might be um, and also where other people in our industry might be. So we've been focused a little bit more on trade in these initial aspects. Um, we were fortunate that we were um, partnered with Amazon and with VoiceFlow in the beginning. So we had a lot of great press around the skills in tandem with the July 22nd event for Alexa Live. Um, and now we're starting to shift our focus to consumers at this time. Um, I haven't activated any paid campaigns, so I don't have a lot of ex experience that I can share with that. Um, our partners have, and I think they've seen a lot of um, pretty great, um, pretty great response to paid social, um, so Facebook ads and other things, as well as looking at um, other audio first channels like podcasts and streaming as a way to promote those skills. Um, what I like to advise people is to think where your audience already is and how you can get in front of them. So if that's a brand, you're looking at your website, you're looking at your packaging, if you do physical products, um, you're looking at your social channels, your YouTube channel, your TV show, wherever it is, and that's where you wanna get in front of your consumers and tell them um, where you are and, and that this skill is available or this action if you're doing a Google one. Um, so yeah, still on the journey for, for these two because they launched, um, kind of ad hoc. Uh, the first one went straight out on the 22nd um, and the second one um, was released a little bit later because we had, uh, we had to have some legal review on it. Um, so we're still working on the marketing for these. Awesome. Thank you so much for the tips there. I think it's always really curious to see everyone's different ways of getting traction and I totally agree. Like go where your audience is and even if you don't have that original base, um, we see people in our community all the time in our forum launching and looking for new people to, to test out. So definitely take advantage of that if you're not already doing so. Cool. Yeah, and focus on the experience. A really good experience will find the audience. Um, it'll have its way of moving forward. And that's those are the experiences which Amazon and Google like to feature. If they love it, if it shows the best technology, if it has really engage, engaging features, those are the ones that will continue to do well and, and get traction. Awesome. Um, so I'm assuming that this has kind of changed a little bit and there's a question that follows up on this and how this has changed since you've gone remote, but what does your normal design workflow look like with your team? Go ahead, Miles. Um, okay, so typically we will um, start with a uh, kind of big picture flow and that doesn't necessarily cover everything but just covers the idea of like what is this skill going to do um and a script um where where we'll we'll write the script early um especially if it's going to be a uh full audio project which most of ours are because uh recording is going to be a big part of the process and and if there's a client we'll need to get them to sign off um and then it we sort of go into a um we have an idea of of what our script is and what our overall flow is and then we um build it out in our tools um or on voice flow and it's when you do that that you catch all the little things um uh, you know you have to build up all the utterances and, and you catch anywhere where there might have been a reprompt missing or what if the user says this. Um, so then we'll, the script will kind of be alive for a little while where we might update it as we're going. Um, and then, uh, and then once, once that's all in place, we often like to uh, start once we have the logic of the skill or action built, we like to get it play tested early. So if this is before audio is ready, we'll try to do it with just TTS in place of the audio um, and then replace that with the audio when it's ready. Um, and then, I mean, that, that's the whole initial buildup process 
from there, it's kind of testing and playing with it and deciding where things should work differently, adding new stuff to the script, perhaps having a pickup. Um, and um, usually we, we just kind of, in terms of utterances, intents, and entities, et cetera, we tend to build those as we go, and that is usually sufficient. Occasionally, there's something really complicated um, having to do with the utterances, and then we'll take a project-specific special approach for that. Um, like if you're doing a something that has a big FAQ in it, it might be harder to get those utterances to all work like you want them to. Um, so, but yeah, I think that's, the, for the main part, it's just build a script, go through it, and then, uh, yeah, just keep playing it until you find where it breaks. Awesome. Cool. The next one over here is, how does this change for brand new projects versus, let's say, going in and managing an existing project? Yeah, that this is like specifically for APLA. No, in in general, when when working on a project. Um, so for APLA, um, now that we have tested it and we really love it, we are going back and looking at a lot of our other skills and seeing where there's places that we can update them. As I mentioned, a lot of our clients are actually music first. A lot of the the skills that we've worked on, like Disney music. Um, or uh, uh, even our or Uno skill, like these, they they have a, a reason for us to go back in and to um, make the the audio sound as as quality as it can. Um, so we will definitely be going back and looking at those, and that's true for every new feature. Um, I saw someone in the chat mention Quick Links, which is something I'm super excited about as a marketer. So the ability to have track the affinity of your marketing to different campaigns and um, to make sure that those you know which ones are really working for you if you're paying, if you're activating a paid campaign that's fantastic too and something that we're recommending for our other clients also um i, th I think that answers your question yeah no that that's great and and to that point as well like there are so many amazing features that came out on the 22nd outside of just epla and i, I think that um, there's going to be, or it's very clear that there's a lot of features that are coming out that are going to enable builders to, to do more iterative testing, to get more immersive with their designs and to promote and track, which is something that you, Caitlin, uh, Caitlin and I definitely have in common in terms of what we, <laughs> what we care about. So thank you. Yeah, we're really excited about comments on voice flow as well. That will <laughs> really help improve the, the conversation design process in a big way. We're super excited about that new feature you just announced. I'm very glad to hear that. Um, I'm sure that Miles being the one that spent a lot of time uh, in the builder himself while working remote would have definitely benefited from uh, the ability to leave comments or keep track of all of, uh, all of the feedback in one thread. That's great. Um, with your experience in audio, how has APL for Audio affected your build and design flow? Have there been advantages or even normally when there are new use cases like this, are there any disadvantages that came out of it? You want to feel that, Miles? Sure. Um, so the I'll, I'll start with the disadvantages, actually. Um, so there's something new, right? And the the systems have all been built up for how the old thing worked. Um, so but that's not really a disadvantage as much as a just temporary, you need a little bit of investment to get all the way there. Um, so the, uh, we had to change our, our tools for getting the audio into, into that form, into, into the higher quality formats quickly. Um, and because our sound designers typically, they'll just give us um, high res waves for us to put into whatever format we want for the skill since they're in these various different formats, whether they're on Google or Alexa. And now, so now we're changing it to output higher quality ones. Um, and then because uh, your no input reprompts 
can't use APLA, you still have to have a few of those low res MP3s up there. So now there's sort of more folders to, of audio to manage. Um, and then uh, in terms of voice flow, and I'm sure you guys are improving this, we were sort of using it the day it was first possible to use it on voice flow. So it was not as refined as the SSML speech blocks on voice flow are because that's sort of the entire idea of voice flow is for those to work really well. So we sort of had to, in our voice flow, rebuild some of that technology directly in it. Um, but uh, but I, I mean, again, that's going to be a temporary disadvantage. In terms of advantages, um, it's really, I mean, it's really just a fancier audio player than the normal SSML is. In normal SSML, you just say, play this audio file and then play this audio file and then have some speech and then play this audio file. In this, like that's a feature you can have, but you can also mix things, layer things, have the have audio file selector logic directly in the APLA document. Um, so you can you can simplify a lot um, of what how many different APLA documents you actually need. Like I think in our two projects, we actually used like three or four different APLA documents and then just had just little differences in the data sources and that's all we needed. Um, and, but they were doing a lot. They were, you know, playing an audio file and then putting a little gap, time gap, and then playing the next audio file and then putting a little time gap. And, uh, and sometimes we selected between audio files. And then of course we had in uh, Animal Rock, we had the big mixer. So there's just a lot it can do. It also has filters, which, I think while we were working on it, we didn't know about, but they're in the documentation on um, Amazon's documentation site now. Um, so there's fade ins, fade outs, volume adjustments, just a lot of cool stuff. It's just, yeah, it's just a fancier audio player, really. Awesome. Yeah, I think that with all new features that come out, there's always that room for the benefit of being the first person on the ground, but also the benefit of coming on after all of those first people have gone in and provided their feedback. Um, and so I, I think that there's a lot to be said about the, uh, the ability to layer multiple audios to your point on fade-ins or even with APL as a whole, it's still kind of a mystery on how to fully get the most out of all of the animations, the transitions, all of the ways to really kind of add that last bit of sheen um, on how your experience looks. So it's a really good point to, to bring up the documentation and making sure that if you're gonna jump on this to, to read through that as well. Thanks so much, Miles. Um, this is kind of something that all of us are thinking about now. With, with these two skills, you guys built them entirely up while you were remote. Is this a different process than what you guys normally do when you're in the office or did you find that it was somewhat similar? Um, I would say that our process mimicked as best it could how it would be when we're in the office. Um, it's nice being just up the stairs from the sound designers and being <laughs> able to have a quick chat um, about how something works uh, or, or what exactly we're looking for with a given sound effect. Because um, it's easier, it's sort of easier to stop in the middle of working on something and ask a question like that when you're in the office. Um, and then uh, it's also easier to show someone something on your device, like when you're testing it, hey, look, it's broken here. See, when I say this, it doesn't work. Um, that's, that's a lot harder over uh, video conference. Um, but otherwise, it's, uh, I feel like, I feel like it's uh, been pretty good. Voice flow actually, I think, helped me a lot in doing it remote because with our normal pre-voice flow tool chain, uh, 
the I would generally I build a document and then I send it to our programmers and then they do some stuff and then they say okay it's ready to test. Um, but here I've I've got my computer here I've got my Alexa over there and it's just you know tap 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 Alexa launch the thing um, and so it VoiceFlow enabled that, uh, us to sort of compartmentalize this a little more. Um, which which helped, I think. I have one funny story to add. Um, so a lot of times we're working with voice talent for either the toys or for any of our voice um, experiences. And um, normally if we're directing one of the talents, we would be in the booth with the sound designer. So we could sort of talk a little offline if we needed takes or anything like that. Um, we had a couple of adults, a lot of adults do voice um, younger kids, um, younger kids characters, but our core person was a young, a young, young lady, a very, very talented young lady. And so um, we did not have the benefit of being able to have offline conversations. And so I had to really be careful in how I gave feedback and how I asked for things. And um, she was such an amazing talent. I have to say, like, we're really happy with who our Olivia was. Um, but I'd have to talk to our designer, Scott, and be like, Hey Scott, what do you what do you think? Do you think we should take it a little differently, or what if she said it this way and and uh, direct um, without seeing people and without that extra, you know, just nice touch that you get from taking in people's expressions and their uh, body language. So that was a little challenging, but um, again, we had such a professional voice talent, and um, our voice designer has been doing or our voice director has been doing this forever. So um, it worked out really well. I'd say we're. You know, we're used to working on Zoom. We're, we're used to working remotely. We have some of our team members um, in different cities across the US. Um, so it wasn't the hardest transition, but of course it's affected everybody. Um, it, it's, it's always funny to, to compare the experience working with in-person voice talent versus working with TTS or Polly, where if something goes awry or if the tone's wrong, you're entirely to blame because you're sitting there <laughs> and trying to code it yourself versus working with the human. There are so many elements. There's so much empathy that's built into that, that we try to replicate ironically in the voices that we're creating. So it's, it's a good point to bring up that flow and that differentiation. The, the next one, and I'll answer this really quick, we've got a ton of questions on where can I learn more about APLA, um, uh, APL for audio. Uh, there will be a link right at the end of this, and I will send it out uh, in the follow-up of this recording. So don't worry, we hear you. <laughs> we wanna get in the hands of you guys as well. Cool. Um, another question that came up is, you guys very clearly work with real audio. You very clearly work with a lot of different, um, a lot of different tools. Well, what does your home equipment setup look like? Oh, I think I think I'm back. I think I, I was lost for a second. Um, can you hear me I'm now? Not, I think that's for sure. Um, <laughs> but I have a home studio set up here. Um, I think that it varies for our talent. Um, but we're lucky, as I mentioned, our our studio actually has um, three different studios. Our, our office has three different studios which each have dedicated air filtration. So it actually has been okay for us to have the sound designers working in their normal setup space. Um, so while the talent is sometimes remote and has varying home equipment for recording the, the voice, um, the sound mixing and all of the equipment for capturing that has been stable for us. Um, I'm not an expert on what the best uh, microphones and such are. I don't know if Miles has anything to share. Um, I'll let not, him. I'm not in. really. It's um, when when the voice talent records from their home. It, it's because they have a home studio set up, and uh, and quite a lot of them do did even before, um, just because it lets them you know get jobs farther away, and and we essentially have our. Um, sound designer call in so that they can hear the audio live and then uh and the talent is sort of recording it uh and, and then they'll just send the files over so it really depends on what they have yeah um feel free to follow up with me i put my email in the chat um if you have specific questions maybe i can get some answers over to you i think that's a really good question 
Okay, great. Uh, next question. So when creating an experience for a client, how do you showcase your proof of concept and testing? I think Miles covered this in the design flow, but a lot of times we will create a text to speech build first and, um, and show that to them so that, and, and do some of our testing based on that. Um, we've even done some just straight up acting where we'll show them the script and read it back and forth to give them an idea for it. Um, I think this is an iterative process. I think using voice flow, which is the first reason we adopted it, um, to, to help build out those proof of concepts and share it easily, um, is a great idea as well. And something we'll probably keep in our, in our, um, in our workflow moving forward. But really this doesn't have to be like, you don't have to spend a lot of money and time, I think on the first iteration, because it's all about being able to prototype and then move quickly to, to optimize it for the experience. So yeah, those get back and forth and see if it sounds good when you're just hearing someone voice it, um, build out a TTS build and um, don't spend too much time on the sound until you are sure that what is actually written there makes sense. And then yes, look into voice flow as a way for prototyping that as well. Yeah, and I would just say in uh, voice as well as in toys, it's, it's hard for people to really get it until they're playing with it. Um, so just the sooner you can have something that they're playing with the better because that's when you start to get the real feedback. Um, and so, yeah, just getting them on some kind of beta, like Amazon has the, the beta system uh, or, or getting them into the simulator um, on, on Google or things like that um, just really helps because they can play with it and then they can say, oh, when I'm at this point, I, I think this should happen instead. Um. Um, we have two more questions and then we'll have our parting wisdom, but one of them that came up is you guys have so much experience building other types of immersive designs, whether it be through chat, whether it be through enabling or doing more IOT. Um, what are some similarities or differences that you see in that transition from some of the previous work that you guys have done to voice? Transitioning from web to bot to voice. Sorry, I missed the beginning of this question. Um, what similarities did we um, I don't think we did much in the in the bot space actually. So that wasn't as hard of a transition. I think again, what really stood out to us is that when a lot of the toys that we design are audio driven in the way that you flow through them. Um, so when you unbox a Hatchimal, for example, um, there's no screen that says push this button and then do this thing or run you through a tutorial. All that has to be driven by audio and by lights and very subtle um, motion mechanical things. Um, so we're really used to trying to help audio be the way that you can intuitively flow through an experience. Um, I think with bots, again, with like chats and things like that, um, you have words. Um, a lot of the, the kids that we're designing for are young, and so they don't even read yet. So we're challenged with some differently abled people. <laughs> I like to call kids differently abled. Um, so I think transitioning from um, our toy space, we, we, we're not a web developer or chatbot developer, we're a toy developer um, before this, um, into voice was actually quite seamless just because um, a lot of the way that we've been designing has been audio first to begin with. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> yes, it definitely does. <laughs> cool. And lastly, this is always really interesting since voice is still very much so on the frontier and is still trying to figure out what that's gonna look like in the future. So kind of to both of you guys, what are your predictions for where experiences could go in the next five years or so? Maya, do you wanna start? Sure. Um, I think like my, my main prediction is just further integration into other aspects of life and Sort of like how uh, all all these different platforms of, of phones and, and computers and things all started integrating into each other more. Um, voice needs to kind of follow up in that footsteps, um, and then uh, just uh, gadgets are a big thing that are just getting started now. Hardware that 
connects to voice. Um, it could go a lot farther. Um, and um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think just more, more ways to start voice experiences. Um, it's all, it's all kind of in a box right now, kind of static. Um, and it seems like they're trying to break out of that a little more. Um, so yeah, it's, it's hard. It's really hard to say though. Yeah, I think I'm also most excited about um, the proliferation of voice going across multiple devices because the more that you engage with this technology and the more data that it has, the more that it can personalize to you. Um, I know that sounds really scary also, um, especially for parents with kids who are do have some um, fears associated with um, just the where their data is being stored and how it's being used. Um, but this idea of ambient computing, the fact that you get you give information and input into devices, um, whether it's um, a touch screen or a voice or a gesture, um, all of that being synthesized to be more of help for you um, and to serve you differently from it as a technology, I think is really exciting. Um, I'm excited as a runner, as someone who's really active, that now earbuds have voice assistant and I can continue running and get a call and be like, oh, I know who that is and I can answer it without having to take it out of my pocket. I mean, these are small things, but the ability to, to be with consumers in areas where you normally wouldn't, when you're washing your hands or cooking with your hands and you can't touch something. Um, when you're driving, I mean, I used to have an hour commute, which I'm thankfully saving now <laughs> by not having to go to the office, but um, all those times where I'd be getting pinged and I'm like, I don't want to look at it because it's not safe, but I'm sitting on 101 and it's really like, could be something that is important because I have a meeting coming up in 15 minutes. Um, all those moments are times when technology could be reaching us and making our lives easier. And, um, you know, I don't know if if technology, if, if all of this technology has actually given us more free time, maybe it's loaded us up even more in different ways. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm excited about the idea that it can be just even more assistive and more conversational, um, the better the technology and the insights are. Yeah, definitely. I think that to your point on being able to go and be platform agnostic of starting a conversation and maybe in your home and jumping into your car and it communicating with the devices that you have on hand. Like that's really that dream network that we have put together and it does come with the tool learning more about you, learning and getting connected to your devices and doing those things. So while it, it's still very much so new on the frontier, I'm very excited about what multimodal and platform ag um, agnostic building will look like in the future. Cool. Um, and so kind of one last thing, is there any one liner parting wisdom to the people in the audience um, as we send off for today? Um, I mean, I always tell people, um, especially if you're working with brands, iterate, really try things. Um, the nice thing about digital is that even though people see things and sometimes they, there's a Twitter response or something like that, you can always change change it really easily if it's out there in the ether. Um, so try things, um, test things, um, talk to your consumers, make sure that what you're building really answers the need that they have and isn't just an insight that you got from talking to one of your friends at a bar the other day in Silicon Valley. Like we have a really um, big country and a big world. And so think about who you want to serve and, and make something that can really help them. Um, but don't be afraid of the new technologies that are coming out because you can always change it. You can always optimize it. And uh, there's a lot of people that can help you do that. So Miles? I don't know. I, I, I don't have anything right now. <laughs> No worries. And thank you so much, everybody, for joining today. Um, we have a bunch of events like this that are coming up uh, later this month. We're going to be sitting down with uh, Stuart, uh, who is the system designs lead at AIG, as well as we have another Fix It Hour with Nico coming up. And uh, something that's kind of in tandem with what we talked about today about the opportunity with kids and working with new platforms like this. We're also going to be doing a no code for all ages um, workshop that'll be coming up where we're going to be interviewing Nelson, uh, who does all of the community builds for Webflow. So definitely tune in for that as well. 
Um, and if you're not already part of it, definitely take a moment to join our community. This is where we get the first hand look at everything that's coming out as well as you're able to talk to experts like Caitlin, like our team and other people in the space. Um, and for all of you who've been asking, um, if you would like to sign up for the beta for APL for audio, you can do so by going to this link. Uh, it's in our community group, but I'll also be sending it up as a follow-up to uh, everyone who attended this as well. So thank you so much. And don't forget to reach out to Creativity Inc. if you have any inquiries on looking to work with an agency. And I will send out the contact information for Caitlin as she has uh, kindly linked inside our chat if you have any questions about APL for audio. And thank you so much, Caitlin and Wells, for joining us today. Thank you, Emily. Thanks for having me. Thanks. And we'll see you guys next time.